Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. This is the podcast for the sixth Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on July 9th, 2023. Our first reading is from Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 through 12. Uh, the alternative uh, first reading, uh, the continuous is uh, Genesis 24, verses 34 through 38, 42 through 49, and then 58 through 67. So some patches there in the 24th chapter of Genesis. The psalm is the 145th psalm, verses 8 through 14. Our uh, epistle is Romans chapter 7, verses 15 through 25. And our gospel reading is Matthew 11, verses 16 through 19, and then 25 through verse 30. We're actually like halfway done with the podcast. So many verses you had to read out there, Joy. <laughs> yeah, and they're all spotted through those long chapters. <laughs> that's, a lot of ver- that's a lot of verses. That's a lot that's of context. Great. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. All right, Matthew 11. Well, and Matthew conveniently skips over some, you know, when Jesus speaks woes to certain cities and things like that. But yes. um, both tough pass- a tough passage, but at the same time, also some of the best words in all of Matthew's gospel in verses mm-hmm. 28 through 30 with, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. It's It's one of those verses where whenever Matthew gets a little angry, Wherever Matthew gets a little too focused on judgment and gnashing of teeth and outer darkness, uh, you need to hold the whole book to account with these words, right? Um, Not to say that these trump everything else in the book, but to say, what does it mean that the same gospel that sometimes has a pronounced view on judgment and, and punishment or just desserts also sits side by side? with some of the most gentle relief giving verses see the beatitudes if you don't believe me mm-hmm. yeah 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 and last week we made mention uh about or i made mention about threading it together and and having this uh, idea of the past uh text that we've read and anticipating the next sermon yet to come and uh this is uh this is a verse that has um uh, these verses, because we're kind of jumping a little bit, uh, has that ability to thread together this idea of um, it begins by how do I compare this generation and recognizing uh, that Jesus was uh, um, not the kind of person that they wanted because he, of what he did. And yet they didn't like John who did the opposite. And, you know, we're not going to like the word that we hear. And um, to tie that together. Uh, with the reality of whatever was preached the week before, um, so that there is a continuity of what folks are hearing. Um, Because it would be so easy for us just to say the promise that we love to hear, you know, which is, you know, take, take, give me by burden, you know, take my yoke upon you. Um, But, but it's set in a context of difficulty. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's, that's really helpful, Joy, in that, and what we're going to get going forward too with the parables coming up in the next couple of weeks is this theme of and you know the 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 16 through 19 you know you want to read the verses before cuz this is about John the Baptist and and how both John the Baptist and Jesus are rejected for their you know the way in which there's rejection all around of the message that they're that they are bringing and that's also going to be the, those realities of rejection and who hears and who doesn't who receives the word who doesn't receive the word you know with the parable of the sower and then the reality of of the wicked and the just in 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 the same field <laughs> growing in the same field and i uh, and so that that whole sort of sense of what's happening here in terms of who's listening and who's not uh, and and yet here there are here there are some who are are receiving this word right the the infants and and it goes back to like that the the 
comment that we mentioned last week about what's the reward and it's not a reward per se, but these verses, you know, 29, 20, 28 and 29, uh, what do those words sound like in the midst of the, the, you know, the competing messages or the competing uh, things that we listen to? Why listen to these words and why, you know, why go to God and not to other sources? And, uh, and I, I think mm, somehow, some way a sermon will kind of talk a little bit about that that kind of context, right, of, of rejection and of, of not being able to hear or unwilling to hear. And yet, um, these are the words that call out to us, right? These are the words that call out. And why is it that we won't want to hear these words? <laughs> why do we choose other words to hear? So I think that's part of it, too. We need these words. Let, yeah, they help. Um... This week, the next two weeks with those parables, they help us interpret why things aren't going so well for Jesus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so they help they help that, but they also, I think, I think they're important passages that will that will help preachers for the rest of Matthew's gospel. Um, we've mentioned, you know, Matthew does have this pronounced focus on judgment. We'll see that with with a parable in in two weeks, and then you know, just wait till. August through October, where there's some doozies. But, uh, you know, I'm convinced that one of the things that makes Jesus in Matthew so angry <laughs> towards some people is it's it's about those who put stumbling blocks before others. In other words, those who make the religious life or knowing God more difficult for others, especially those who don't have the time or the means to pursue a religious vocation. Uh, and he also is furious about religious systems or religious people uh, who refuse to hear a new word from the Lord, which I think is what's coming through here, right? John, eh, you're too much of an ascetic. Jesus, eh, you're a little too libertine. Now, the trick is to make that that anger on Jesus' part not an anti-Jewish anger. It's not him rejecting Judaism as a whole, as a flawed religion. It's a particular way of practicing Judaism. It's a particular leaders that he seems to think have 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 occluded right have, have clouded over access to god for the people who who need it most and need comfort the most and so like last week we talked about giving a cup of water to one of these little ones right to the people in their vulnerability and and i think that doesn't necessarily explain away some of the anger but it helps you get a sense for this is not a raging angry god as much as it's a god who is really sick of seeing Privileged people shut out those who most need access to the gifts of a life with God or the, the power of a life with God or the comfort of a life with God. That was yeah, a long lecture, I, sorry, but I think that's I think that will help a preacher to start to develop some of that here. I think so too. And and I think the other reality that we the other contextual piece here is also the the imperial reality, right? Of being a colonized people. And and so when you think of, you know, what are what are some of those heavy burdens? What are those what are those imperial burdens that have been placed on uh, on the people of, of Palestine, whether it's taxes or um, or or fear of of what, you know, what Rome will do in response to uh, lifting up these kinds of these kinds of principles. Right. When we know what happened with with uh, with Jesus. But I think too, um, the uh, as uh, you know, verse thirty, you know, is probably better translated. My yoke is kind and good, uh, and and then my burden is small, and uh, and just I think something along the lines of you know that how kindness and goodness um, and and rest. And rest from heavy burdens and gentleness and humble and heart and rest for your souls. Again, that those are the marks, right, of the kingdom of God. Going back to what we talked about last week of the small gesture of a cup of cold water. That um, if we kind of carry this through of, uh, 
of how people recognize or live out or know, you know, when is a prophet, when is a prophecy from the Lord? It's this goodness and it's kindness and gentleness mm -hmm. and rest and a call to rest for your soul and, um, and a rest from these heavy burdens. Uh, and, and somehow a sermon I think has to help people feel that, uh, feel, what does it feel like to rest from that? Um, those, those burdens and expectations, what does it feel like to, um, to have gentleness extended to you, uh, and kindness and goodness? Um, because, you know, so much of what is extended to us, uh, and so much of what, what we receive or what we, what we're given is not that, um, some thoughts. So we already you've talked about how this goes back uh, in the ground that our previous sermons, uh, Matt, you pushed us forward to know what's coming in this to, to set us up to anticipate how this will fit in with the parables that that we'll learn. But this tie back, um, I like to remind us to not forget that what we preach about God and God's promises has to be consistent. We can't have, as some people like to say, well, I don't like the God of the Old Testament. Give me the God of the New. And so that's why last week uh, when we were talking about Jesus's words uh, in of welcoming, reminded us that that's the kind of people, God's people, the Jews were to be. And so Matt, when you were saying let, we need to be careful not to make this an anti-Jewish message, um, that's exactly it. This is what it means to truly be the people of God that Judaism was created to be. And in the midst of that context, for this moment that you described, Caroline, of being under the empire, bearing the burden of living in this political reality, in this cultural and social reality, this promise of rest, is, it's, it's a big gesture. And I think that there are some parallels that our congregations can experience of, of feeling the weight of our cultural, our personal, our, our uh, ecclesial realities. And how is it that the promise of God will give us a, a invitation to a rest we need, a, a, a burden that is light enough to carry? Um, and that that's on us as, as the preacher to prepare a message that is that real because it was so counter the empire, it got Jesus killed and it was so real. We're still talking about it 2000 years later. Well, I think in that same image, uh, you're talking about joy. It's, there it is in the Old Testament with Zechariah, the, the, uh, the idea of a of a God who puts aside the chariot and the war horse and, mm -hmm. and, and comes in gentleness. So, so you can't just say, give me the new Testament God, uh, cause there's the image, right. Of, of a God who extends peace from nation to nation. I like the idea of how do you feel that? Like what's the feeling of rest or what's the feeling of seeing your, your King, uh, show up on a donkey. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? you're kind of yeah. like, this is out of place, but, um, yeah, and and the experience of humbleness, you know, that when you're in the presence of humility and humble, uh, a humble demeanor, um, which is just so antithetical to everything else that we hear right now, and yes, every yes. everybody else who has a you know all all the people who have a have a voice and a podium and a microphone, a podcast and a, <laughs> uh, a podcast. <laughs> yeah, but there's very yeah, find a humble person out there. It's <laughs> who wants the, to be and, a leader. Yeah, yeah. And that countercultural narrative, you know, in the midst of um, that ancient culture, as if 2000 years ago isn't ancient, but in the Zechariah ancient culture, um, in that in that reality, um, a leader is not supposed to come with humility. And the prophet is speaking a word of prisoner of hope you know i'm i'm captivated by this reality of hope 
So yes, um, as as you've uh, highlighted, Caroline, and you turned us back to Matt, how do we feel that? How do we proclaim that so that this reality of hope uh, in humility is what will restore us rather than um, the claims of power and might and overbearing? Um, because that that's the fall. That's, that's where empires and institutions break us because they become arrogant and overbearing uh, and they don't give us what they promised and they therefore become empty of the hope that has held us captive. All right. So we look uh, at these scattered verses just, in Genesis? Scattered verses in Genesis. Chapter 24. <laughs> This is, you know, I think back at the beginning of summer, I right after, right after uh, Trinity Sunday, I said it's hard sometimes with some of these semi-continuous stories, especially when they go through Genesis. It's it's easy to lose track of of who's the god of the story, and this is maybe a really good example of a passage mm -hmm. like that because it's it's charming. You get to talk about ancient ancient uh, coupling and you get to talk about dowries and you get to talk about well scenes and all that stuff. And, you know, it's like, is, is the covenant going to continue one more generation? That's the risk here and risk is averted. And we found a wife for Isaac and there's all sorts of gendered implications that are disturbing, have to be explained. And before you know it, you've preached for 18 minutes and you haven't said anything about who God is or why this passage <laughs> matters for God. It's, that's my worry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about a text like this, I, I'm not sure what it even does say about God, except God provides. But maybe it's just a quirky story. You're supposed to have a little bit of fun with it too. I don't know. I like that, Matt. An invitation for us, and I think I said this last week, to linger in the story. In this particular case, last week it was about lingering in the reality that trusting God isn't something that comes easy, um, and you can't just jump to it. Well, here, let's linger in the fact that there's a history here. So we talk about context of the preaching moment almost as that kind of tool to make us uh, handle the, the word more rightly. But uh, in this particular case, it's reminding ourselves that we're talking about people with a culture. And in order to live in the cultural moment that we inhabit, we do not have to um, undermine or ignore or even discount their culture, um, respect that culture. And as you say, Matt, in respecting that culture, pull from it the fact that it gives us the story of a God that holds us captive in the promise and covenant of hope. And, and so, yeah, maybe we can linger for 18 minutes in, in their history. Why? Because they are the ones who pre preserve the story of a covenant keeping God. Yeah. And I, that, I think that's really helpful. And I, here I would actually bring in the Psalm. If you were uh, going kind of in that, yes. in that direction, um, I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. And, you know, the original promise to Abraham, you will have descendants as, as many as the stars in the heavens. And, What's so interesting about this story is like, or these kinds of stories is that so much of that could have been narrated in, okay, so then Isaac met Rebecca and then Rebecca, you know, it, it, it just sort of like a summary of what happened. Mm -hmm. um, and here's who here are that, you know, here are the descendants and God fulfilled God's promises or whatever. And yet we get these stories, right. That, that the, the sort of, uh, microscopic look into these these episodes, right? In in how did this? How did these multiple descendants come about, right? right. How did that right. even happen? And mm -hmm. we're invited to linger into the the details, mm -hmm. right? Of of how this did come about, mm -hmm. and that it and uh, and it you and you can't summarize that, right? You mm -hmm. can't you you, you can't pull that into like a neat little, you know, paragraph that it unfolds in the lives of these people uh, and, and the ways in which there are unexpected moments of, 
of of interaction and meeting and and yet and and where and where is God in all of this and to what extent that's our lives too right that that um that we that we're invited you know that the stories or the episodes the moments in our lives are are representative of of always of larger themes but uh and r- larger realities of our lives but they're but they don't, those themes don't have, a, they get embodied in our episodes of life and our moments of life. And I, that's how, how I kind of see this story too. It's like, you know, And in a context, I always like to remind us that in a context that is supposed to be all about men, this brings in the reality of Rebecca and Rebecca's family as part yeah. of this culture and part of this practice and part of this reality. And so we can acknowledge that and be able exactly. to. I'd like a sermon that, that tells the that, story from Rebecca's um, point of view, which would require quite she, a bit of creativity mm-hmm. uh, because mm-hmm. she has little agency. They, you know, they do ask, will you go at this man? And she says, yes. I will. I'll go. But her decision to do that is to me just as astounding as Abraham's decision yeah. and Sarah's yes. to leave Abraham's father's household and follow this God. You know what I mean? That she, exactly. she does have enough agency here that she glimpses something in a story that otherwise sounds like she's being claimed or sold or something. You know, there is this can we attribute a kind of faith to her in a God she might not know and people she doesn't know that would be, um, I would find that interesting if that, if the story supports that kind of a sermon. And I think that's critical for us because in that culture, the way that those practices were lived out are different than they were, than they are now. And they are for us. And, um, is there a way to recognize the movement without completely dismissing the culture? Let's respect it because it, you know, as we think we've reached a moment where we know things better, um, we tend to want to completely eliminate the past. And I think there's, as you said, Matt, I think there's an agency that is present and we should acknowledge that. If it's simply the fact that this woman's story is told in this man's culture. And I, I, and yeah, one more thing on that. And we're reminded of this, uh, the generations of the matriarchs, right. By the, by the mention of Sarah in Mm -hmm. verse 67. Right. And, and of course, this is also, you know, Isaac is comforted from, but, you know, during his mother's death, but, Mm -hmm. uh, but that mention of Sarah too calls to mind, you know, Sarah's willingness and yes. and Sarah's agency, and now Rebecca's agency. And so mm-hmm. it's uh, it's you know seeing Rebecca in that also that that larger generational history of women who are 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 a part of this huge part of this story as well. And so that yeah. and she's going to be prominent on, when Jacob comes along too. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I should say one last thing too. I, obviously, some of our listeners have people in their congregations who were uh, part of arranged marriages or had maybe parents who were or uh, might have people who married somebody with very, very little warning time uh, under different cultural circumstances, different economic circumstances too. And so we might learn something from that about how does, you know... I'm not saying I, that's what I want for uh, for myself or for my children, but but how does that matter for thinking about how faith gets passed along? I learned I learned from one of my students years ago, um, who was from a culture of arranged marriage, and um, one of the points they made for me that just really st- stuck was that in that covenant keeping love came after and they kept the covenant and their comparison was that sometimes for us the love comes first and we make a covenant we can't keep and that was interesting for me as i think about as you said matt the kind of god we serve a god who made a covenant with us and keeps that covenant 
which we experience as love. And therefore the psalm. So, there's the psalm. You just like Remarkable. summarized the psalm, Joy. <laughs> I right? did. I made a with my chosen one. I will sing of your steadfast love, O oh Lord. So there it is. Yeah. Now that's how I would use the psalm. There we are. There we yeah. are. Yeah. As well of, um, yeah, but that, and that establishing your descendants forever. Um, and so when the psalmist is saying, Right. When the psalmist is saying, I will establish your descendants forever, here's the backstory, right? There's the Yes. Here. Right. I think you might be on a different psalm. I was gonna oh, I say, am? I'm I'm you're yeah, I think you're a is that last week's psalm? But okay. it's it's, it's, it's the it's, same promising covenant keeping God. Yeah, uh, okay. There you, you know, go. gracious, also, merciful. They basically abounding. just all say the same thing anyway, so no kidding. <laughs> they, they 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 do, don't they? Um, Sorry about that. Yeah. It's in my pocket. That's weird. Okay. And yep. if you choose the whole psalm, it does talk about about um, one generation to the next. And there you go. If you go if through you the decide. rest, it's all yeah. going to come back around anyway. All right. <laughs> here's the here's the thing. You can make any psalm work. You can, unless it's like Psalm 22 or something rough <laughs> like that. But yeah, you can you can find something in there. <laughs> right. Or 44, I think, is another tough one to work with. Tell Rolf I said that. Yeah. Yeah. Don't. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, listeners, please don't tell Rolf anything that we say about the Psalms. Never. Yes, we, we will deny it. <laughs> that, is, that is our little secret. 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 Yes. Yep. Do not That's tell right. Rolf. About All right, us. Romans. All right. To... So it's a horrible segue. I don't understand my own actions. Did we just have a moment where we just don't understand what we just did? Don't do that with the text. <laughs> It just when it pops up on there, yeah. So we're still in Romans here, uh, and um, uh, this is a, uh, I guess a good, um, a a good, um, a good Lutheran um, law and gospel text. Um, not being fair, but there's a a lot of mention here of of the law, um, but I always read read Romans as it moves into the grace. Uh, that is offered. Um, and so so here there's a, a similarity to um, how we begin with John and Jesus not being um, what was expected. And here Paul says it in his own self. You know, so when we were reading the gospel, it's, you know, do you want that kind of leader or do you want this kind of leader? And when you get get to the epistle, it starts off with, um, in my own self, there's this, you know, dichotomy, this discrepancy. Um, th th that was one thing that sort of stuck out to me as I threaded the two together. Um, this life that we live is not one that is just a very quick yay or nay. Um, and maybe it's because of the liminality that we've been living in, but this this uh, seems to to capture that. Yeah, I, I would point people to the commentary too. And there was particularly one line that was really helpful when, you know, when Paul is describing these competing, right, these competing forces within himself. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, you know, sin is an opportunistic tyrant mm -hmm. using that was a good line. At hand to maintain and extend its hold over human beings. And I think that's worth a sermon there uh, in terms of how is it that we talk homo, you know, how is it that we talk homiletically about sin as not, not just things you do wrong and a moral kind of, uh, kind of framework, but it's this, it is this power, right? Like a tyrant that will use, you know, use whatever it's at hand to take over and to control your behavior and control who you are. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I think inviting people into that kind of space of difficult space, but of really acknowledging when and how they've seen that happen in, in themselves and in others where they, they, they see what sin can do. Uh, and, and it's not about, it's not, like I said, it's not just, oh, you know, I, uh, these little, these little things that, that, uh, 
that we, you know, we chalk off to sin and say, yeah, that's, you know, I, I shouldn't have done that. That was a bad thing to do or whatever, but it's much more, <laughs> much more at stake here when it comes to Paul. And that thing that sin co-ops here is, it's not so much Paul, the human person, it's the law itself, which, mm -hmm. you know, which Paul yeah. elsewhere calls holy, just, and good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is not an anti-law kind of a passage. It's a, uh, have you considered the power of sin kind of a passage that, that even God's law provides, it can be made to provide us a haven for sin to do its, its damage. Yes. Um, and it's, if, if, if sin can hijack the law for its own purposes, what else or who else uh, might it hijack? It's always good for religious people to stop and ponder mm -hmm. in all of our various crusades. <laughs>